Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa <coughs> Okay, so today's reading, um, I've chosen uh, a book of Ajahn Sumedho's, Don't Take Your Life Personally, and uh, <coughs> uh, the book is uh, um, done by the Buddhist Publication Group, and they are out of L Leicester in, in England, and they, uh, every year for uh, many years, and I don't know if they still do it or not, but there's a, like the Leicester Buddhist Summer School uh, that was, was done, and a variety of Buddhist teachers <coughs> would come and give instructions, and uh, this is from a series of teachings given uh, by Lumpo Sumedho over, um, I think, 1989 to 2006. Um, and this particular talk <coughs> is from August 7th, 2004, and it's, it's titled uh, This Endless Rebirth, which I thought was a, um, like a, a nice sort of another facet of uh, Marana Sati. <coughs> As this is the last day, I want to reflect on the perception of separating, of leaving, of the end of the Leicester Summer School, 2004. On the first evening, there was a sense of something about to happen, and that was a different feeling from the one now of being faced with the inevitable separation of leaving. So this is an exercise in reflecting on just the simple experience of meeting and separating. It is not a matter of making value judgments or statements about it, it is merely recognizing the reality of this moment with this sense of the conditions having arisen for separating. It is like this. The separation is still in the future, of course, at about 12 o'clock today or something like that, so we are not talking about a memory. <coughs> we might remember previous summer schools, but this is recognizing the conditions that exist at this moment, this sense of the end of something that began on Monday and is ending today, Saturday, the actual physical separation being a couple of hours away. One's life is a continuous experience of meeting and separating, isn't it? When you think of your life from birth to death, it is this process of coming together and separating, of starting and finishing. The realm that we live in, this sense realm, is impermanent, so every beginning has an ending. The beginning is the potential, the possibility, and the ending is remembering what has been experienced, <coughs> the people we have met, and the things we have done during these past five days, for example. Now the future is no longer connected to the summer school. It is about going home, going back to the monastery. Tomorrow afternoon, I have to give a talk. The tendency is to mix our awareness with wanting to define it, qualify it, or compare it with something else. Hardly ever are we fully appreciative or tuned in to the reality of life as we are experiencing it. And during the ending of something, we usually start planning our next move, so don't fully experience ending and separating. This is the samsaric <coughs> tendency of attachment, the round of rebirth. When you become bored, <coughs> and you don't observe boredom unless you are practicing mindfulness, you seek something interesting or exciting, or at least something to distract your attention from the boredom of the present moment. Life is a process of searching for rebirth in this way, a continuous sense of being reborn again into some new thing, something that interests you. But try to sustain an interest for a long period of time. What happens? <coughs> Inevitably, you become bored even with the most interesting conditions or experiences. Too much pleasure actually becomes boring. 
If you live an exciting life with lots of adventures, romance, and pleasure, after a while you become bored with it all and think, I just want to go off to the mountaintop and be alone. So you go to the mountaintop, you're there for a few minutes, and then start planning how to get back down to the next thing you think you want to do. (coughs) This is rebirth in terms of what we might actually contemplate within our lives. The word rebirth doesn't necessarily mean physical rebirth, being born again in the next life. It can mean the mental rebirths that are so ordinary we don't even notice them. As soon as life becomes boring or unpleasant, we seek rebirth into something else. That that means beginning again, choosing something that has the potentiality for for fulfillment, for happiness, for entertainment, for being totally mesmerized and taken over. Like those pop movies about sex and violence, sexuality, physical violence, war and conflict excite the mind. You don't have to concentrate on them. They just hold your attention. Not that there is anything wrong with that. I'm not complaining about it or condemning it. But just talking about taking notice of how the mind becomes excited. Much of life isn't exciting, is it? It is just this moment, just nothing much. If we are not aware, the tendency is to want to fill our lives with plans, possibilities, distractions, eating, drinking, television, and many other things. Peacefulness, calm, emptiness, and stillness, we can't stand, actually. They're just too hard to bear. Because of the tendency of the mind to wander, to plan the future or remember the past, most meditation techniques are related to concentration exercises. This is a way of training the mind to stay with an object and absorb into it. When you absorb into something, you actually become one with it, and the sense of separateness falls away. By doing a color casino meditation, for example, you become that color through absorbing into it. Years ago, I did one on the color green and started to see green in everything, even when I wasn't concentrating on it. I absorbed into it, and the result was a heightened sense of greenness. It was a beautiful color, too. At least mine was. It wasn't one of those murky greens. And in the jhana (coughs) absorption practices, you take a subject, and by concentrating on it, you experience rapture, a sense of physical oneness with the subject, a kind of physical pleasure, then mental happiness, and then one-pointedness. So these are like meditation exercises. It isn't right to refer to them as attainments because they are actually relinquishments. So in the jhana practices, you recognize how to let go of the coarser factors until there is nothing left but equanimity or one-pointedness instead of trying to get rapture and happiness (coughs) through conceiving them and aiming for them. (coughs) You let go of the desire to achieve and go towards an increasing sense of surrender and relinquishment to the object of concentration. Like any form, however, this is limited. Conditions that support tranquility and refined levels of consciousness are limited. The world we live in is not a tranquil realm. It is a sense realm full of stimulation and irritation. The senses are constantly being impinged upon from birth to death. Even pleasurable impingement, when when you look at it, is a kind of irritation to the senses. Even sensory experience at its best, when seen from emptiness, is irritating. It is kind of inadequate. (coughs) This word meditation can, can encompass almost anything any kind of mental training you can think of. And the tranquility practices are basically about concentration. One chooses an object and focuses on it. Very often, a lot of the insight meditation techniques also end up as concentration practices because the technique tends to dominate. One absorbs into the technique rather than using it for awareness. This is why during this week, I am pointing to this sense of trusting yourself to intuitively recognize natural awareness. You can't see it, but you can know it. Awareness, then, is formless. And this, I think, is what we find difficult to accept. 
Our whole conditioning process is aimed at seeking rebirth in form, attaching to some form, becoming something. The ultimate freedom of formlessness can therefore seem quite frightening, especially at first, because all forms, boundaries, and identities fall away. <coughs> and our emotional habits cannot cope with that. Our emotions don't know what is happening. It might seem that we are having a breakdown, losing our minds, and suddenly we don't know who we are. So this can be frightening. I have met people who don't have a very good self-image, and yet they know who they are. I'm a Buddhist. I'm a Theravadan. People take on identities, and that gives them a sense of security. But when those identities fall away, then what are they? Their emotions are conditioned around becoming something, around happiness and suffering. So when they reach this point of emptiness, or even just get near it, emotionally it can be very frightening. <coughs> They want to find a place where they can feel, well, I know what I am now, I know who I am now. This sense of not knowing with awareness, however, is not a state of stupidity. It is centered on consciousness knowing the way it is. It isn't a judging, critical factor. It doesn't seek to evaluate, criticize, or prefer. It is the direct knowing of the way it is. Now, I find that the way <clears throat> Insight meditation is often taught leads people leads to people becoming obsessed with the idea that all conditions are impermanent. In some ways it can be like an intellectual projection. I've heard people say, "Well, everything is impermanent, as though what it isn't worth grasping anything at all because it's all just going to disappoint me." That is a kind of wet blanket approach, isn't it? I'm going to fail and I'm going to die anyway, so what's the point? This is not vipassana. Uh, the word literally means insight into the nature of things, or yoniso manasikara, getting to the very root, the very cause of the thing, directly, direct knowing rather than knowing about. <coughs> vipassana isn't a function of thinking, but rather of trust, trusting intelligence, and that is a universal. Intelligence is not a personal thing. It isn't cultivated in the sense of having to increase anything. It is more a matter of learning to recognize and appreciate the natural ability we already have. We have the potential for enlightenment, for seeing in this clear way without attachment to anything whatsoever. <clears throat> I found that reflecting on space gave me some insight into infinity. I thought I knew what infinity meant, but it was just an abstract idea. It was defined by not, but not recognized. I am not making a statement about infinity in the way a scientist might, nor am I trying to philosophize about it. I am simply talking about recognizing the reality of space at this moment. Space has no boundaries, does it? It is infinite. So, as I open to just space, starting with the space in this room, I realize that although the walls look like boundaries, they too are in space. Infinite space is reality in this moment. <clears throat> and when I contemplate that, I don't dismiss the conditions that are here. I don't have to shut all of you out for that. Uh, I don't have to shut all of you out for that because infinite space can receive everything, all forms, all conditions. <clears throat> And forms do not hide the spaciousness of this moment. I also used to regard consciousness as being in my brain, in my head. But then, in reflective meditation, I realized I couldn't say that consciousness was in my brain, because it seemed to be everywhere. The fact that I can actually see you at this moment means you are in my mind. You are in my consciousness. Consciousness holds you at this moment because that is the way it is. But you are not in my brain. At least I don't think so. <clears throat> These things are so obvious that we don't usually notice them. That which is most simple and most real can be overlooked because we always move towards extremity, towards certainty, towards wanting something that doesn't exist right now, towards getting something we imagine would be wonderful to have but don't have yet or looking around and thinking, we need to get rid of what is here in this moment. 
because it is all an obstruction to my peacefulness and enlightenment. <clears throat> the realities of space and consciousness are here and now, however. They are a fact. So if we use that for reflection, if we notice it, pay attention to it, we will have perspective on the forms and conditions that arise and cease throughout our lives. We will have perspective on thoughts, emotions, the sense of oneself as a person, love and hate, greed, hatred, delusion, fear, pleasure and pain. And it is impossible to define infinity because language itself is not infinite, it is form. This is why I emphasize trusting in awareness. Before we learn to speak and before thoughts arise, awareness is present. Awareness and consciousness are always here and now. Deathlessness is another term to contemplate. Death right now, for all of us, is what has not yet happened. We haven't died yet. <coughs> it is therefore a concept, isn't it? We can think of Catherine Hewitt now. Last year she was alive and she was here, and she was sitting right there. The perception now is that Catherine Hewitt is dead, and that is different, isn't it? It has a different feel to it because death is what we don't know. We might like to know what happens when we die, and there are various scenarios about reincarnation, heaven, hell, or oblivion. I might go along with what the Buddhists say, or the Hindus, or the Christians, or whoever, but the reality, at least from this position right here, is that I don't know. <coughs> I am confident that my body will die, though. I am not trying to make my body immortal, a deathless form. That, I know, is not possible. So, is deathlessness just a wish in the mind? Is immortality just a wish because we are afraid of death? Or is it reality? In Buddhism, we have the words Amata Dhamma, the deathless reality, and Amaravati, the deathless realm. And the Buddha pointed to deathlessness as liberation. He didn't point to some kind of perfect state or form state of, as liberation. If we explore the beginning and ending of conditions as we experience them, we will have the insight prior to physical death that what arises ceases. Conditions arise according to other conditions. So when the sun shines, it is like this. And when it is raining, it is like that. When the conditions for happiness are present, we feel happy. When the conditions for sadness are present, we feel sad. And when, <coughs> and when everything is going well and no threatening warning signs envelop us, we feel secure as a person. As soon as threatening signs recur, however, we again feel insecure. So the conditioned realm is all about beginning and ending, birth and death. That is its very nature. <coughs> the sense of a self, the personality belief, is also a condition. It also arises and ceases and changes according to conditions. And insight meditation is a way of reflecting on conditionality, of getting to recognize that conditionality is like this. So what is the flavor of the world? What does the world taste like? My mind would try to make that into some kind of complicated, maybe even poetic form. But the flavor of the world, to me, is always unstable. There's always this, this sense of something missing, of incompleteness, of unsatisfactoriness. Even at best, <coughs> even when everything is just fine, even when I have good health and everything is just the way I want it to be, there is this kind of fluttery experience. Some people I know have been very fortunate in their lives, but some of them also have a lot of fear because they know it will change. They can't sustain security and the best conditions. And we know that. We know that we can't hold on, no matter how hard we try. The more we try, in fact, the more miserable we become because the very act of grasping is an unpleasant state of mind. This means we can't even enjoy beauty. We suffer even with beauty because we want to hold it and keep it. The point is to notice this without criticizing it, just as a way of awakening to the way it actually is, awakening to the Dhamma. 
Deathlessness, then, is our true nature. My personality gets born and dies all the time. I used to think, what part of my personality would I like to live with forever? And I couldn't find anything. The idea of being a unique soul that would last forever made me wonder, well, what is it in my soul, the soul that is unique to me as a person, that I would want to be eternal and never die? And I couldn't think of a thing. There was nothing in my personality that I wanted to have, first as a unique person, and then to go up a grade and become a unique soul, so that when we're all dead, you would say, oh, that's Ajahn Sumedho. And I would say, I'm a soul now. I'm glad you recognize me. What, <laughs> what if we all had to live here in the grounds of this beautiful garden forever with no option of getting out? All good people, beautiful place. If we were permanently what we are on the conditioned plane, we would still have anxiety and insecurity because the result of absorption into conditioned phenomena is our identification with it. The only way to resolve that problem is to understand it, to know it, and to awaken to it. And that awakening is Buddha. It isn't Buddhism in the sense of knowing all about Buddhism or knowing all about being a Buddhist. It is actually the reality of Buddha, of awakeness. Try to imagine deathlessness, and all you get is some kind of immortal fantasy where everything is beautiful, where you're young forever and there is no disease. This is a childlike fantasy of paradise. As you trust awareness more, however, the formless and unbounded is not seen as a kind of un <coughs> unconscious annihilation, but is where you are... <coughs> <coughs> where you are no longer obsessed with ignorant grasping. Right now, we are all experiencing forms arising and ceasing from this emptiness. It is like a miracle, and that is just the way it is. We're not trying to seek annihilation so that all forms die and no form ever arises again. That is the desire for annihilation, for extinction. Sometimes when we are fed up with ourselves and the world, we would like to just become nothing, to disappear into the void. But that is a wish, another desire that we, that we create. Suicide is not the answer. You simply get reborn, because that is the nature of desire. Every moment we recognize awareness and really trust and learn to appreciate it, joy comes, compassion comes, and love. But it isn't personal. It isn't based on liking, preferences, or karmic attachments. The Dhamma is not the destruction of conditioned phenomena, but the container of it. <clears throat> All possibilities of conditioned phenomena arise and cease in the Dhamma. And there is nothing that can bind us once we see that, because the reality of the Dhamma is seen rather than the forms that arise and cease. Mindfulness reflections are skillful means the Buddha developed for investigating experience, for breaking down the illusions we hold, for breaking through the ignorance we grasp at, for freeing ourselves from form, the limited, and the unsatisfactory. Rather than teaching too many techniques now or giving too much structure, I prefer to encourage people just to trust themselves with mindfulness and awareness. Often meditation is taught with this sense that one has to get something or get rid of something. But that only increases the existing idea of I am somebody who has to become something that I am not and has to get rid of my bad traits, my faults, my defilements. If we never see through that, it will be a hopeless task. The best, the best we will ever do under those circumstances is maybe modify our habit tendencies, make ourselves nicer people and be happier in the world, and that isn't to be, to be despised either, but the point of the Buddha's teaching is liberation. Generosity and morality will of course help us create more happiness in the world. They will lead to self-respect and good relations with others. When you are positive and happy, people like you, and you tend to have more friends and more worldly happiness just by being good and happy. Being miserable and bad just creates the opposite. Nobody likes you if you are if like that, and you live in a world of fear and resentment. 
The point is to notice how it is. Happy thoughts, good thoughts, <clears throat> make you feel happy. And when you are happy, you're a lot easier to be with. When you think negatively, then you think of what is wrong with you, what is wrong with others, and what is wrong with the world. So when you meet people, you start grumbling and complaining and making them unhappy as well. This is where kamma comes in. In the West, the word kamma is often taken to mean fate. People talk about my kamma, meaning my fate, my destiny. But the word actually refers <coughs> to cause and effect, action, reaction. And so we have the simple, do good, refrain from doing bad. Good kamma is doing good and receiving a good result. And bad kamma is the reverse. If I harm, lie, steal, and disrespect people, people will hate and resent me, and I will live in a hell realm of negativity. You hear of these power of positive thinking kind of cults where you are told to just think happy and you will be happy. But there is something in us that sees the superficiality of that, of suppressing negativity by obsessing our minds with positive thoughts. If we know what we are doing, that is fine. Using mantras, malabis, chants, and these kinds of things can be a skillful means. They can have a good and calming effect on the mind, but they won't if we are just using them to suppress fear and anger. In Buddhism, they are used for reflecting on Buddha Dhamma Sangha and can bring a sense of gratitude towards the Buddha, for example. I do in any case feel a lot of gratitude towards not only the Buddha, but also towards Ajahn Chah. This sense of real gratitude for having been given so much in my life and a sense of gratitude is also very positive. It gives one a reference point to something other than just resentments and criticisms. Monasticism itself, monastic training, is all about contentment learning to be content with very little. <clears throat> Every day we reflect on what the Buddha allowed a bhikkhu. A bhikkhu is allowed a meal, a robe, shelter for the night, and medicine for illness, the four requisites. If you reflect on these over the years, you find the sense of contentment. You're not just trying to get the best robe, the best shelter, the best food. It isn't a matter of whether it is your preferred meal or whatever. This is very good for someone like myself who was brought up in a society where contentment was almost despised. In America, we think that anyone who is content is a bit stupid, like a cow chewing cud. To be discontented, on the other hand, is a sign we're trying to progress. Don't be content with anything except the best. But even when we get the best, it doesn't stay that way because we always see somebody with something better, and then the best changes. This kind of movement of the mind is the way we create endless discontentment with the material world, with our families, with the conditions we are living in, and with society, because we can always imagine it being better. Contentment is not, however, a matter of just ignoring things or deluding ourselves. It is a reflection on the fact that we don't really need very much. My needs are minimal, actually. If I have high standards, high expectations, then I have to struggle to get them and keep them. That takes a lot of effort, and I wouldn't have time for meditation. If I suddenly win the lottery and find myself a multimillionaire, I would still be programmed for... Now what do I do with 100 million pounds? And maybe begin to wonder why people are being so nice to me. But notice that contentment comes through the recognition of what is important in your life, what is really worthy of your attention. You can't make yourself grateful. So what are your needs, really? <clears throat> and what are you conditioned to feel you must have? This is a way of not being caught in the obsession of getting more and more, an obsession that really blinds you. How then does one teach mindfulness and awareness? It can be pointed out, and situations can be presented for people to reflect on. But apart from that, I think it is a question of confidence, which is why I keep saying, don't trust what you think you are. Don't believe it. What you think you are is not what you are. Whatever you think or believe you are, you are not that. 
That is just a perception you might be obsessed with or attached to, but you are not that. Keep reminding yourself. <coughs> it is so easy to believe I am this person. It seems real to me when I am attached to such a perception, and it seems that to deny it would be wrong. Of course, it isn't a matter of saying, I am not anything either, or of adopting some kind of denial of the condition, but rather of recognizing conditionality, receiving conditionality and letting it be. Let whatever you think you are be what it is, but relate to it in terms of the knower. Whatever you think you are or believe yourself to be is your creation, but you can actually be aware of that. And that isn't to criticize it, but to realize that it is no more than a bubble, no more than foam on the sea without essence or substance. <coughs> In a monastery, there are opportunities for solitude as well as community life. The lifestyle itself has those options to it, but people can get very attached to solitude. I've got to be alone. I can't live at Amarawati. There are too many people here. That is binding oneself to the idea that in order to really practice, you have to find a place where nothing is going to irritate or threaten you. The truth, of course, is that it doesn't matter where you are or who you are with if you trust your awareness. If the only time you can ever really feel you are mindful is under ideal conditions, in some nice meditation hunt, where everything is properly arranged for you and you feel quite safe and secure and all your wishes are fulfilled, then something will come along to ruin it. I went to an ideal place once and thought, I'm really going to get my samadhi together here. Then one morning I couldn't get up off the floor. I didn't know what had hit me. Later I discovered I had malaria and the recurring attacks lasted a year. During that time, I kept thinking it was ruining my practice and that I couldn't practice with malaria. Then Ajahn Chah came to see me and he said, that's your practice now, malaria. I hadn't thought of it like that before and had I just kept thinking, I can't practice because I feel so terrible. In the end, I learned a lot from that episode. I learned about the fear and suffering I was myself creating around having the disease and eventually realized that when I opened to it, the symptoms were bearable. They were uncomfortable, but nothing I couldn't bear. I was surprised about that. The personality is conditioned for, I can't stand it, I can't practice. I don't know whether I'm going to die. It goes to your brain, doesn't it? You go crazy with this, don't you? I've heard of, mine, of monks losing their minds. They get cerebral malaria and get taken off to the mental hospital. No possibility then of enlightenment. The worst case scenarios came to my mind. Fortunately, it didn't go to my brain. It was certainly an unpleasant physical experience though. And yet it also had its quite nice moments. The fever would reach a peak and then suddenly break. And when it broke, there would be this incredible sense of coolness and that was very pleasant. So even within the experience of malaria, there were pleasant moments on the physical level. <coughs> the flavor of the world then is unsatisfactoriness. Now, this isn't meant to be a put down of the world. I'm just pointing to the nature of it. And its nature is change, birth and death, coming together and parting. The world is like this. It is an ongoing experience of coming together and separating, of meeting and parting. Notice that when we part, we don't usually like to say, goodbye forever. We say, see you next summer, see you again. However we put it, it usually amounts to, see you again, see you soon, let's keep in touch, with that sense of, in the future, we'll meet again. Because the perception of never meeting again is too stark too hard to bear. Emotionally, we would like to meet again. We don't want a total separation, unless it is from somebody we really can't stand. During this next year then, reflect on these things and try to trust yourself more in your practice. Don't criticize yourself. Don't believe your critical mind evaluating your ability to practice because that you can't trust. It will say anything and will usually be in terms of not being good enough. <clears throat> or needing to practice more, 
or not really being a good Buddhist, and on and on like that. This is the conditioned mind. Most of us are very self-critical. Most of us see ourselves through the flaw, hold to that, and, they, and then make it into an enormous problem. So I encourage you to let go of that habit. Recognize it for what it is, but then don't perpetuate it. Learn to trust in your own goodness and awakenness and see what happens, see what comes. Whatever state you experience doesn't really matter because your relationship to it is knowing rather than identifying with it or judging it. Sometimes in meditation, negative states come up that have previously been suppressed. Well, see that as a process of purification rather than as a sign that you have been practicing wrongly. There's a lot of commitment to suppressing negativity in our lives, of just denial, rejection, and resistance. When you stop resisting in meditation, however, when that habitual rejection lessens, then the states that have previously been held back come into consciousness. But see that as a purification rather than as something wrong with you. What I'm pointing to is a level of faith, of confidence in the human ability to be awake and aware. It is the same for everybody. There are no exceptions. It is a matter of recognizing your true nature and finding that you are not what you think you are. Every thought and every attachment gives a sense of limitation. The very fact that you can open to infinity, to space, to consciousness, however, gives you perspective on that. It frees you from this endless rebirth, this habit of going from one thing to another. Okay. Any questions, comments? Lone person or himself gave me that book. Oh. And signed it for me. Ah, lovely. Here, don't take your life personally. <laughs> 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 My parents had it. Oh, lovely. Yeah, it's, no, it's very special how they got sort of signed by him. Okay, looks like it's pretty straightforward. All that's left is to do it. 